Thanks very much, and uh, good morning, everybody. Um, so, to give you a bit of context for what I'm going to say today, I feel rather inadequate. I'm not an economist, and I've just listened to three or four very impressive economists talk about their work. I'm an engineer by background who's got lost in the maze of multidisciplinarity, <laughs> and I'm working with the other two authors here, which are uh, Thomas Hartland, who works for Hartland Shipping, which was spun out of HSBC uh, about 15 years ago, I think, and um, took all of their shipping, banking, technical advice with it. And Rebecca Mully, who is, um, was working at Lloyd's Register, she's, she's since left, since we started the work, I hope not because of the work itself. <laughs> and Lloyd's Register is, um, in case those who aren't familiar with it, Lloyd's Register does most of the advisory services um, for ships, mainly to do with safety, but increasingly to do with their environment specifications. So really we're coming at this from a very practitioner, technician and financier perspective. Um, but we still can't figure out what day it is. The, the work that we're doing and the work that I'm going to try and share is still a work in progress and so it was great to hear that a few of the other presenters this morning were saying the same thing. So please bear with me whilst I share some relatively straightforward and early work. Um, I'm going to start with a bit on the possible causes of stranded assets and shipping. Um, and that's quite broad ranging, I'm not just talking about CO2 at that point. Then I'll focus in a bit more on CO2 in, in particular, and then explain some of the work we've been trying to um, assemble to think about a framework for how we can evaluate whether an asset, in this case specifically a ship, is stranded or not. And then I'll talk about where we hope to go next. And in the background on this slide, you'll hopefully see why we think there is an obvious link here. Um, whilst we think about the end of the coal industry and the extraction of coal, feel sorry for the poor ship owners who've got all the assets which move it around the world, like the one in the back of the picture. Or don't feel so sorry about you. <laughs> so this is um, an animation that I'm going to show you to try and just help, help us understand and visualise the problem, but also explain a bit about the type of work we've been doing at UCL. This is an animation showing very large crude carriers moving around the world, um, moving the crude oil mainly from the Middle East, from West Africa and from the Gulf of Mexico, so the various refinery locations around the world, which um, used to be obviously Northwest Europe and the US, but is increasingly Southeast Asia. So you can see this conveyor belt of ships moving um, as they take the, the oil to the market. And that really illustrates, hopefully, sorry. That really illustrates, hopefully, the type of data that we're working with. So we use those data sets to understand ship movements on an hour-by-hour -hour basis. And actually, shipping has a phenomenal data set because the world's fleet, every single ship in the world, we can observe with that resolution hourly by hourly movement. And there is quite a lot of market information that's published as well. So we can draw really important conclusions about the relative energy efficiency of different ships, what they're carrying, where they're moving to and from, and how that affects their market values and what we can deduce from that about stranded assets. And that's one of the areas that we want to go on in this work. So to step back a second <coughs> from the data and talk about um, some of the causes that we've come up with uh, for possible stranded assets in the shipping sector. So there's the obvious supply side, by which I mean the ships themselves stranding. And in recent years, and the main example that I'll use in a second, we've seen real changes in the shipping market as more and more efficient ships have arrived as a result of the period of high oil price and low revenue that's hit the shipping market since about 2008-2009. So there's some um, dynamic in the market which is, which is starting, we think, to strand some of the existing assets. There are lots of questions about ship size and um, many sectors, for example container ships, have got bigger and bigger. And actually there was some stranding in the 80s and the 90s when the super tankers were built. Um, and those ships became so large they couldn't be operated economically. They couldn't be traded except in one or two ports and they became um, irrelevant as a result. And so we've actually reduced the size of the biggest tankers back from the tankers that we had in the 80s. Um, and there are questions about whether we'll get stranded assets in the container sector because of ship size um, being too exuberant and the growth in size. But there are also impacts of things like the Panama Canal and the Suez Canal changing its dimensions and whole classes of ships which were built specifically for those dimensions and to optimise um, the economic, economics of trading through those locks. Um, those ships may well just suddenly become uh, irrelevant because the, the size constraints have been um, loosened. Then there are questions about CO2 <coughs> intensity and 
the regulation that might occur in the shipping industry itself over the next few years in order to help the sector transition to uh, low carbon and a sustainable long run. Um, and then finally I've got on the supply side some of the regulations that are already in place and, and increasing in their stringency, which are about other air pollutants, SOX, NOx, um, but also other um, environmental externalities, for example ballast water, which is regulations that control uh, the technology used by ships to discharge um, ballast water when they move from one port to another, which is particularly important as a risk from a non-indigenous species invasion. The consequence of all of that is that there's actually some very high capital cost, five, six, seven million, that every ship is going to have to invest in in the next few years to comply with that regulation. And the ships that can't justify that investment are not going to be able to trade in certain places, for example, Northern America. So there's stranding that can occur there. The main reason to go to the Sox and Knox point is because some of the solutions that solve those emissions problems have impacts on CO2, but also produce unique stranding opportunities. So liquid natural gas is being touted as a marine fuel very strongly at the moment, partly because you reduce obviously zero SOx emissions, sulfurous oxide emissions, partly because you can relatively easily control NOx <coughs> in certain engine technologies, and also because the in industry loves the idea that they could find this uh, CO2 reduction from the technology as well. And, and so it's really difficult to talk about CO2 stranding without bringing in some of the other regulatory push factors like SOX and NOx regulation that might impinge on the, on the technology solutions but also the financing and the economic viability of those solutions. So that's all supply side. On the demand side, there are also stranded risks and I think the, the picture on the previous, uh, on the contents page is probably the greatest articulation of this. Most of what ships, oil tankers, coal, um, and gas carriers are moving around the world by mass is fossil fuel commodities. Um, there are container ships that move computers and top shop clothes and all the other types of commodity that we move around, but predominantly by mass what we move in shipping is fossil fuel. And so obviously if the world starts to decarbonise and we're not demanding as much fuel, that's not such a, a promising future for the demand side of the shipping industry. Um, so to zoom in a little bit on CO2 and energy efficiency, this um, graph shows where the shipping industry, or at least the regulator of the shipping industry, the International Maritime Organization, which is the UN agency in charge of international control of shipping, and has been since the Kyoto Protocol given the mandate for dealing with shipping's greenhouse gas and CO2 problems. And that organization, two years ago, um, did a study of the sector's emissions, but also the expected future emissions from the industry over the next 40 years. Um, it was a study that our group led and has been used in the last couple of years in both the UNFCCC and the IMO negotiations. And the graph here shows um, the spread of scenarios from the highest growth in emissions scenario through to the lowest one. And just as with many other sectors, there's a fan because there's uncertainty, both in the demand for shipping in the future, but also the rate of decarbonisation that might occur or energy efficiency might, improvements that might occur. And the main um, point to make on this is the dissonance that occurs between all of the IMO's um, imagined future scenarios and the two degree scenario that we're all familiar with from the IPCC AR5 work and I've just taken a central value here to show that scenario down here. And it was incredibly politically difficult to have this discussion at the IMO as the lead author of the work, we were overseen by a panel of countries, 19 countries from China through to Norway, who all had different agendas and all had different points that they wanted this work to make. And what we've ended up with is obviously influenced by that and shows that the shipping industry itself believes that it will see growing emissions in the next 40 years. And at some point, the IMO is going to experience a major correction to that pers perspective. At some point, it won't succeed in, in having that, and that could cause a rapid change in policy. So to try and illustrate why that might be credible, I'm going to take the example of the Marshall Islands, um, which is uh, a country in the South Pacific, and I'm sure many people know it's also very low-lying. It was, uh, it's, only, it's average height above seawater is two metres. The Marshall Islands happens to be the third biggest country uh, in the shipping industry from the perspective of tonnage registration. And every ship flies a flag that is associated with the jurisdiction um, of that ship. And at least 10% of them are currently flying the Marshall Islands flag. The government has spotted the very obvious um, hypocrisy in their position of 
In the UNF triple C saying we need to decarbonise fast, whilst making lots of money out of a shipping industry that is not doing anything about CO2 emissions. And at the last IMO meeting this summer, the government put in a paper calling for the shipping industry to have a target imposed on it, um, or agreed within the IMO, so either UNF triple C um, saying that it should have a target, or the IMO setting a target. And a target for the Marshall Islands needs to be consistent with 1.5 degrees, um, but they're saying that they would accept 2 degrees if that's what, what they came to. So, um, since that summer intervention, there's been a lot of pressure on the Paris Climate Agreement to include explicit text for shipping. And that uh, is something that's going to be crucial if the IMO is going to change. But I guess the point that I want to emphasise here is that there's a real risk for the sector, which has lulled itself into this sense of security <coughs> that nothing is going to change in the future. It will be able to continue just making incremental energy efficiency improvements as oil price or whatever is that's dominant cost. It's a natural <coughs> process that occurs anyway. And the potential for major disruption of the state of travel in the policy space due to governments like Marshall Islands taking some very progressive and important leadership. So what might this mean? Um, and here is just an articulation of the, late, of the earlier supply and demand side stories. Um, here are three graphs that were derived from IPCC AR5 two degree consistent scenarios, so the SSP4 scenarios if anyone's familiar with that. RCP uh, 2.6, and they show, derived from those economic projections and energy commodity projections consistent with the two degree storyline, the, the future of demand for three of the main ship types, container shipping, dry bulk, and oil tanker. And there's some very rapid growth um, expected in demand side, even in the two degree future, um, for at least two of the sectors, container shipping and dry bulk. So maybe we can feel a bit less sorry for the coal ship carrying um, magnets because because actually those are the ships that will suddenly start moving biomass around the world or will always continue to be used for moving food and grain around the world. And the container sector is um, anticipated to continue to expand uh, consistent with the continued containerization of goods and commodities. But then we see this interesting demand side impact on the sector as well, and that's oil tankers, the red line at the bottom, showing a projection that at least in the two degree scenario, it would halve its demand over the next 40 years. And that's a mindset that the industry's never had to deal with in the past. Everything has been a steady growth in demand, and that sets the bank, the banking sector, it sets the financiers, it sets the um, ship owners in this constant sort of, I can order the new ships and maybe they'll be oversupplied for a couple of years, but ultimately demand is always increasing and, and we'll need more ships. So the consequence, just to articulate this a little bit further, the consequence of that policy shift could be that um, instead of the IMO's current suggestion, which is the red line of the future CO2 emission gradually rising, the sector is set on one of either the blue or the green lines. And the point that is obvious associated with cumulative emissions is that the turning point of emissions um, has an impact on the gradient of the subsequent CO2 curve. And if the IMO continues to procrastinate and the sector lobbies against uh, regulation, then it will find itself on this worst curve, on this curve that sees the greatest rate of change, greatest rate of decarbonisation. And uh, we've been busy trying to articulate this because we think it's, it's a real education issue for the industry, that if they could only see that actually they're their own worst enemy, that that might be a good way of mobilising action. And this graph shows the rate of change of energy efficiency or carbon intensity of ships over the next 40 years consistent with a couple of those scenarios that we saw on that previous slide. And the story is fundamentally that shipping will have to get 60 to 90 percent more efficient if it's going to have anything like its continued share of anthropogenic CO2 emissions. The alternative to that is to increase its emissions relative to all the other sectors, at which point it will start to get some real attention like it's never seen before. And our projection suggests that under current BAU it's heading to be 15 percent of anthropogenic CO2 assuming nothing else changes elsewhere. To put some extra context on this, the average economic lifespan of a ship is about 30 years. So you'd be buying an asset now, which would be in existence when efficiencies were 80% higher on average. Um, the financing period is naturally, as it is in most sectors, a lot shorter than that. Banks are typically mortgaging for 7 to 12 years at the moment. Um, and so the, the actual time horizon is relatively short. But they factor in at the end of that seven year period a second hand value, and it's the second hand value that sort of represents what then might happen in the future. 
And that's where the really interesting potential is to articulate the, st the stranded asset risk. And just to feel sorry for the sector, and again for, a short, for just another couple of seconds, the, the, the average contract length is incredibly short. So the owner of a ship probably has a contract in their pocket for two to three years of that ship's operation, if they're lucky. In a lot of cases, it's one year to 18 months. So they have certainty of revenue for that period of time, and then they're back on the market looking for another contract hire for another couple of years. And so they may, may have a finance deal for seven to 12 years. They probably <coughs> intend to offload the asset, maybe after their charter period, maybe after five years, maybe after 12 years. But they'll, they'll have no security in their revenue for stream for that period of time. And it's just as in many other sectors, inculcated this very short-term thinking that makes it difficult to engage um, the stakeholders with a conversation about who's going to get left with this asset when the efficiency, radical efficiency change takes hold and, and really starts to wipe out the value of your portfolio. So I want to move on now to a framework for assessing um, whether a ship has become a stranded asset, and this is very early work. We're taking a case study, which is a Suez Max tanker, these are particular ships um, of a certain size, and uh, comparing a 2010 ship, which has been built and is an old, uh, less energy efficient ship, with a 2015 ship, which is about 15% more efficient. Um, and the question I want to ask is, if I invest in a second-hand ship in 2015, with a five-year time horizon on that investment, what is the risk of the investment becoming stranded? I want to try and make, on this slide, a point about the cyclicality of shipping markets, which I'm sure is represented in many other industries as well. But many ship owners are used to dealing with periods of negative profit for quite a long period of time. So it's very hard to isolate the environmental risk factors from their mindset of thinking about economic risk factors. And they might face revenues as they do at the moment, <coughs> which are extraordinarily low, maybe a factor of two or three lower than the average, or they might be in a boom time. And, and they all play the game, not all of them, but many play the game of, of asset play to buy and time their entry and exit to that market rather than thinking about minimisation of operational costs over a lifespan. So there's a, there's a mindset uh, behind the markets which, which drives a lot of the behaviour that we see. But if I was to buy a new build in the current year, I'd pay 65 million and I would be banking on there being revenue associated with about $30,000 per day. That's the current sort of long run average price that ships are being paid. Whereas the second-hand assets are coming in at a cost of 46 million, so they look attractive because there's a discount to new build. But their higher fuel costs means that in practice, to get parity on, on investment rate of return, I would need to have another three and a half thousand pounds per day in terms of earnings. I would need a stronger market. And the consequence of that difference, even if I was able to crystallise the stronger market, is a, is a value erosion, at least in the, in the terms that we've been modelling, of about six and a half million dollars. And so this is just our attempt to try and model and say, in answer to that question, can we set the framework up? And according to the answer, we identify current new second-hand ships already as stranded assets. But we'd like to do a lot more work to stress test that and explore what the bounds are um, and whether that's something that we can see promulgate further into the future. And this last slide is just an explanation of the conceptualization of the shipping industry that we're using in a lot of that modeling. It's a 40-year projection, a techno-economic with socio and political factors built into it model of um, how the shipping industry evolves, how demand evolves over time, but also how investments are <coughs> made. And if we have got to the point of refining our framework for assessing strandedness, <coughs> that's a word, um, then we would like to deploy that and explore how various different policy outcomes could influence the level of stranded um, assets and the turbulence that that could create in the shipping markets. So to conclude, um, we think that there are a number of stranded assets emerging in shipping, uh, not least climate change related, and both on the supply side and the demand side. Shipping is, is not unused to managing long periods of low or even negative profit, um, but even under present market conditions, um, it's obvious that there's a, there's a very significant risk that stranded assets might occur if they haven't already. And further work is needed um, we can both to understand the possible magnitude of stranded asset risks in different futures, but also the stakeholders um, that could be affected. So who is at the chain of the finance of these vessels? Is it simply banks or are there much more interesting webs? And just as in any other sector, we find some really interesting webs. Brilliant. Thank you very much.